Uh, we've got a couple minutes, and, and honestly, what, I'm, what I'd like to do uh, is just is broach or, or start a topic that we're going to circle back to later this semester. Uh, and the reason that I want to do that today is because it touches and it pulls on um, this, this concept of, of family and dedicating families, but also uh, the reality of the foster care system. There's, so there is, there's just something that's been on my heart for probably the last, I want to say, three or four months, um, a little bit before January. I like the Lord's been showing me a, a couple things that are pretty interesting. Um, uh, and, and one of them, I would say, is more of an idea, and the other one is very specific for our church. And I would say the thing that is very specific for our church is where I want to start. Um, the, the thing that is very specific for our church is this. Uh, it, there, is, there is the reality that it doesn't matter how big of an idea we um, want to pursue for God, and it doesn't matter how great a vision we can come up with, and, and let me put it this way, it doesn't matter how big a vision that God gives to our church, um, if us inside this body right now, okay, I'm not talking about people that may come next week or three weeks, I'm talking about this group of people right here that call yourself Mosaic, that you're like, man, uh, that's my home church, right? You might attend every Sunday, you might attend two times a, a month, but, you're, but like you call Mosaic uh, your church. I, I really get a sense that God has something for us as a church to actually meet a need, right? To actually affect our town and to actually be something that's kind of uh, momentous and purposeful and, and just good for the city, right? To be the way that Jesus would talk about the church being like a city set on a hill or actual salt that's a preservative, but to be not just this benign existing thing in a city where we do our worship and then we go do our thing and we're just kind of, we're just, we're just kind of like everybody else, right? Um, I really get a sense that there's an opportunity and there's an open door for us to, to do something that, that, that matters in a way that affects our town. But the reality is, is it does not matter the, the, the bigness of that and it does not matter the vision could be so compelling and that God gives me all these great words and I'm like this is what we're going to do and you're like heck yeah that's what we're going to do I know now after having worked with human beings in just in a ministry setting for over 12 years that it does not matter the size of the vision if we as a group of people are not strong in him and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nuance it this way if our families are not strong in Him, then it does not matter the size of the vision because we as human beings and our family circle is too weak to carry that vision forward. As soon as we come into trying to realize something beautiful and, and take back territory in a way, when I say take back territory, what I mean is this, we start to push into dark places and we start to actually affect dark things that are dark because of spiritual influence that's a part of them. The minute we step into those places, we as human beings come under a sort of attack and our families come under a sort of attack. And if we are not strong in the Lord and our families are not strong in the Lord, then what happens is we just get pushed over and that vision falls by the side or that calling or the way that uh, 1 Thessalonians would put it, that work of faith that God has for us, the work that can only be done by faith, it doesn't actually happen because we stormed into that battle unprepared. Okay? We decided to move on something that sounded cool and felt cool without the reality that we as human beings are not at a place in the Lord where we can handle anything cool. Do you follow what I'm saying there? Because I want us to do cool stuff. I, like I would love to be 75 years old as the pastor of this church. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and there's like a legacy of sustained transformation behind us. Like a legacy of sustained transformation behind us. That behind us would not be the families right now who have young kids in this church. I would honestly love it if in 20 years, we are looking at strong, stable, kingdom-building human beings. We're not all in here wallowing about how our children walked away from the Lord. You follow me here? 
Wow, like... So when I say that, I, I, I want to show you something real quick, okay? And of course, I'm going to show it to you from a place that I seldom go in the Bible. Don't even whisper it. <laughs> then God said, let us make humans in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. That's just a shorthand way of let their choices actually matter. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock and over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So here it is. So God created humans. Adam is the, the Hebrew. It's not just man. God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Now here's a point that, you know, I've said this verse a thousand times, but never said this point. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. So hear me on this. When God created human beings, I want you to see something. He didn't create individuals. Do you know what he created? He created a family. He created a family. We and in, we in the United States, we are shaped by a, an idea or a philosophy that looks like and is called rugged individualism. Okay? Do you know what I'm saying? This is why, like, John Wayne is John Wayne. Do you know what I mean? This is why we love Marvel. This is why we love... Um, Who's that dude that like when his daughter gets kidnapped, he goes in and kills everybody by himself? Yeah, Liam Neeson, right? That's why we, that's why, this is why we love like, we love the story of the lone ranger who can go in and just take down, you know, everybody. Like he just rolls in. He doesn't need anybody else. He doesn't have anybody else. He's just the lone ranger. We love that story. We love the story of the, the guy that comes from poverty or the woman that comes from poverty and she scrapes and he scrapes and pulls, pulls themselves up by, them, by their bootstraps and makes it in this world all by themselves and doesn't need anybody, right? We love the idea of a rugged individualism. We love the idea that we can make it on our own and we don't need anybody. We think that's so heroic. But I want you to follow me something in here. Goodness, okay. I want you to follow me on something here. That's Genesis 1. Let's go to Genesis 2. <clears throat> Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, You can surely eat of all the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat it, for in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. And then Yahweh God said this, It's not good that the man should be alone. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Then he does something weird. Do you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't make a helper fit for him yet. Do you know what he does? Now out of the, now out of the, uh, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Isn't it so interesting that God looks on man and He says it's not good for the human being to be alone. And then what He does is He puts him at work doing the thing that He's got him there to do so that the man realizes that it's not good for him to be alone. So God realizes something, but the man doesn't realize it yet. And the way that God helps the man realize it is He has two of each of the animals pass in front of him while He names them. Right? 
So he starts naming the animals. And this is just an exercise of dominion. This is a poetic way that Genesis is talking about exercising the dominion of Genesis 1 is the naming of these creatures. But by the time that Adam gets done with it, he's like, oh God, there is nothing like me out here that can actually come alongside me and help me do the thing that God called humanity to do in Genesis 1, which was not just work the ground, but be fruitful, multiply, fill, and subdue. And so you see right here that it's not good for the man to be alone. He doesn't recognize it yet. And so he puts him to sleep. He takes a rib out of his side. He forms woman. Man wakes up and then sings this song. At last, by Etta James. Somebody... (laughs) No. At last, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the idea that I want us to begin to grapple with for a little bit is this that the fundamental building block of human society is not a person, it's a group of people, okay? Let me put it this way. Do you know how the atom functions? You know how the atom, the A-T-O-M, it's the building block of everything that you know in the material world, right? It's It's the atom itself that's the building block. But the atom itself functions quite a lot like a family does. It's a proton with a neutron connected to it, making a nucleus. And you know what surrounds that nucleus? And you know what keeps the energy inside of that atom? You have these wild things that are circling that, nu- that, that nucleus. You know what I'm saying? You have these things called electrons that are circling that nucleus, and that little building block, that little building block is how every single thing in this material world is made. Did you realize that human society is actually supposed to function in the exact same way? That in Genesis 1, there is a man and a woman who come together. There's a man and a woman that come together. And their job is to build these wild little things. You know what I'm saying? Those of you with young kids, you know exactly what I'm saying. They get a little older and they move out to the next level and they move out to the next level, but they keep circling and they're just as crazy and wild. From the biblical perspective, from the biblical perspective, the family not the individual, is the building block of human society. It's the family, not the individual, that receives callings from God to do things. Genesis 12, God goes to a man named Abram who cannot have kids, and he says to that man, I will bless you and I'll make your name great. I'll bless those who bless you, bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. And in you, all of the individuals of the earth will be blessed. Is that what it says? In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. <clears throat> all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go over something real quick, and I want you all to stay with me for it. <clears throat> so poverty is a social problem that neither business nor government can solve. Poverty and homelessness is a social problem that neither business nor government can solve. Uh, Constance, I saw you here. Where are you at? There, you moved. This is, the new, this is the new seat for Constance? I like you out front here. That way I can ask you questions. So I, I think I'm remembering this right, but you told me this when we first started talking about uh, the village knack. Um, and you had a little phrase that you used for why people can end up um, homeless 
and in poverty. Uh, and it was a catastrophic loss. Is that right? It was a catastrophic loss of what? It was a catastrophic loss of family. Is what sends most people from a stable life into a broken place needing just a home and food. So it's a problem that neither government nor business can solve. Now, government and business can help mitigate some of the effects of that, but the problem that created homelessness and poverty is a catastrophic loss of family. Abortion is a social problem that neither government nor the church can solve. Did you know that if, if churches, or let's just say, if uh, abortion is completely outlawed in the United States, let's just say that it's, it's completely outlawed in the United States, you realize that the, the issue isn't solved. Because abortion in most cases, not all, but abortion in most cases, not all, is the product of two human beings, two individuals, who have no desire to create a nucleus, but do want to have the physical feelings that go along with creating a nucleus. They engage in these beautiful, wonderful acts that only were given to a man and a woman inside of a covenant relationship. Inside of a covenant relationship. So it's not that when God says, don't have sex before you're married, He's saying, I just hate that. I hate it. I hate sex. And I don't want you to do it. What He's saying is, is when you do that, you are engaging in an act that can create human beings. You are engaging in an act that actually has the power to create human beings. And when you decide to go about creating human beings and you don't invite those young human beings into that little thing that we call a family where there's a man and a woman looking at each other and saying, no matter what comes out of you, I'm not leaving you. And no matter what comes out of you, I'm not going to rip this family apart. When you bring human beings, young, vulnerable human beings, and you, and, you, and you bring them to the earth, you cause them to be birthed into existence, and you don't invite them into that sort of covenant home and that sort of stability, you set them on a trajectory for, for the possibility of so much pain and so much, so much turmoil and so much hurt and so much difficulty that God is looking at it saying, do not do that. It grieves my heart because you're playing around with a creative element and you're doing it so that you can feel good, but you're not doing it so that you can take this human being and you can raise them inside of this covenant thing called a home. When he says don't do it, it's from a place of goodness. It's from a place of a desire to protect that fundamental unit. And so there's a reason that God, there's a reason that God refers to himself in familial terms. He calls himself God the Father. There's a reason that he refers to you in familial terms. There's a reason that when Jesus dies on a cross to forgive the sins of humanity, that he doesn't first call you guys the church. He primarily calls you what? The bride. Everything that God does, He does in familial terms. Even God relates to Himself in what? Familial terms. Father and Son. Jesus dies on a cross to make you guys the bride of Jesus 
and the sons and daughters of God the Father, and then calls you guys to call each other brothers and sisters. Uh, and so, in reality, there's, there's, a, there's three or four sermons that I want to dig down deep into over the next couple of weeks after we get done with, with where we are and identifying who we are as a church. Um, because I do believe that God longs for us to be a place where breakthrough can happen, a place that's known for God's blessing, and a place that's known for God's presence. I do believe that's exactly who he has for us to be. But more so, I believe he longs for us to be a network of very, very, very strong families, both biologically and spiritually. Both biologically and spiritually. Because what you're not going to find in the Bible very often is a nuclear family. A mom and a dad and their kids. What you're going to find in many cases is a mom and a dad and their kids and their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles that create this thing called a household. What you're going to find very often in the New Testament is a mom and a dad and their families and the people they employ and their close-knit group called a household. And then you're also going to see throughout the New Testament, especially in the words of Jesus, Matthew and Luke are a couple really important places where God recognizes that that for these people that start following Jesus, that they may start following Jesus and they have to leave their family to do so. That their family, their mom and their dad, may not want them to follow Jesus. And you know what Jesus says in return to that? When Peter says to Jesus, look Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. Are we doing the right thing? We've left mothers and fathers and brothers and houses and lands to follow you. Do you know what Jesus says to him? He does not say to them, that's all good, all you need is me. He doesn't say that. He says, nobody who has left mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and houses and lands won't receive mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and houses and, and, and lands in this age and eternal life in the one to come. What he says is, if for the sake of following Jesus, you have to in ways create boundaries around your biological family and you've got to step out of that, what you will receive from him is something even stronger and more beautiful is the spiritual family that you can get drawn into where you can have spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers and spiritual brothers and spiritual sisters. That's, he, he doesn't say it doesn't matter. He says, if you lose that for me, I will give it to you in a different way because I long for you to have it. Because the fundamental building block of human society and the fundamental building block of the kingdom of God is a family unit. It is a household. It is a, it is a spiritual father and a spiritual mother. It is spiritual children. It is spiritual extended family. It is biological mothers. It's biological fathers. It's biological children. It's biological grandparents. It's spiritual grandparents. It is a thing that is a network of extremely strong relationships. And here's the deal. I know for sure, I know for sure that we can talk about that all we want, but building those sorts of relationships is extremely long and difficult. It takes time. It takes trying. And it will not happen with everybody in this church. Do not expect to be family with everybody in this church. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is that there are spiritual grandparents in this room that need spiritual grandchildren. There's stable men and women in this room that need spiritual children. There are biological families in this room that need the church to walk with them in the strengthening of their own family and that the church not be a place that pulls you apart from your family but actually supports the family and what it's doing. So I have a, a, real, I have a, a, a real desire from the Lord in this that we've got to enter a season 
to where when we say that this is a house of breakthrough, that this is a house of blessing, that this is a house of presence, that we are spending a season and a time strengthening that house so that that house can actually be one that knows how to bring breakthrough, not from this stage, but from the people that you relate to. That this place knows how to be units, little units, little family units that know how to bring about blessing in the life of other people. Little family units that you left your home where you're experiencing the presence of God in your living room and you came into a church where you're experiencing the presence of God here. And so I'm going to say one, one thing real quick. Just So men in the room, I'm going to begin to call you starting today to get beyond the conception that your role is simply to gather resources. No, your job is to validate and integrate the roles of your household to such a degree that each person in that family unit knows who they are and why they exist and how they are helping fulfill the current goals of the family. That's what a strong family is. A family that knows why they exist and knows why each of the people in that room exist. You know, we, okay, hold on. Sorry, you're going to give me a few minutes. We can freak out about uh, gender dysphoria is all we want, right? You, okay, the, especially if you're, if you're a boomer in this room or above and you're watching our culture go to a place where it's like, how is it that people can't figure out whether they're a man or a woman? Like, how does that go on? I need you to understand from a philosophical perspective, that's just the end of the line of rugged individualism. There's a straight line from John Wayne to that. Because the role of the family specifically says is that I, I have human beings and then I gather them around my table and I am consistently setting an example of what it looks like to follow God the Father and then to speak into them in a specific way so that they understand who they are and what they are. We've accepted some weird idea. We've accepted some weird idea that we're supposed to leave our children as a blank slate while they figure out who they are. We ask our kids questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up? We don't ask them questions like, how do you want to gather resources when you grow up? We make their job their identity. Of course they're confused about who they are because they were never told, you're my son, you're my daughter, and this is who I see in you, and this is who God sees you to be, and this is how I understand you, and this is what you were made for, and we're building a legacy, and you can gather around that as long as you want. So of course, they, of course rugged individualism says, I can be anything I want to be, which means I could be an astronaut, I could be a superhero, or I can transition from this biological identity to another biological identity. Identity is always understood in relational terms. It's not understood in individual terms. When Jesus gives you an identity, he gives you an identity as a son or daughter of God. When he gives you an identity, he gives you an identity as the bride of Christ. My, my sons and my daughter don't have an identity that is separate from me being their father or Lauren being their mother. Identity is relationship and relationship is identity. You can take all of the identity, like biblical identity classes that you want, but if they're not rooted in relationship to God and relationship to the biological or spiritual family, then you don't have an identity. You just have some names that you're calling yourself. So when I say that the family is primary, and I say this also, I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm screaming. I don't want to scream. There, there is the real, the real deal. Sorry, okay, y'all know who we are. There are demons that want to tear down men, period. I'm not, let's not dance around. I want women in this church I want women in this church to know what their role is inside this church. I want, and I want women in this church to know that they can stand on this stage and preach. I want women in this church to know, I want women to know that they can be called pastors in this church, that they can be ordained, right? Like I've been working real hard for the purpose of elevating and clarifying what it looks like to be a woman of God in this church. The only... Okay. okay, Jesus, come on. 
But one of the reasons that I'm doing that, one of the reasons that we're going there is because if we don't identify specifically what the role of women are inside the church, you can never really healthily identify what the role of men is inside the church. Because men will constantly hold a woman down out of fear because that's what our culture has done for a long time. We freak out because we're trying to figure out like, why, why are women so mad? Where did feminism come from? Feminism came from men doing this to women for a long time. It was in the church forever. Okay, so of course they're lashing out, right? When Jesus calls the church his bride, do you know what he does? He gives his life for her. He gives his life for her. He loves her. He loves her. He gives his life for her. And then he scoops under her feet and elevates her. And he says, I want you to reign with me. Romans 8. Okay? The curse of Genesis 3 is that the woman is always clamoring for the man and he has authority over her. The revelation of Jesus is that he dies for her and then elevates her to be his co-heir. Okay? But it still says in Ephesians 5 that a man, that a man is the head of his household just like Jesus is the head of the church. We clarify women so that we can clarify men. Men have roles and women have roles. Women have powerful, meaningful roles. Men have powerful, meaningful roles. But there is the real deal invitation. There is the real deal calling. There is the real deal push right now. That unless we as men really begin to understand what it looks like to lead a family, to be the head of that household, to not just gather resources, but to be the one who is integrating. Some of your wives might have crazy vision. Rebecca's got crazy vision, right? Let's like, this thing was birthed in her heart. Do you know what I mean? Like, let, let, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that the man's job is to integrate that, to create space for that, to identify roles in that, to look their kids in the eye and say, you are this, to take other kids in this church that are not your biological sons, that are not your biological daughters, and look them in the eye and say, you are this and you are this. This is what you are. This is what you are. Spiritual mothering, spiritual fathering. All right, sorry. Um, Young men in the room, your job is to get to work. Work is not a product of the fall. It was a beautiful gift that God gave Adam prior to the fall. Prior to the fall. Your job is to get to work. What is God's hand on in this season of your life? Is it school? If it's school, get to work doing school. If it's not school, get to work doing work. What is God's hand on in this season of your life? And then here, and what compromises are you making to indulge your flesh so that these very powerful and formative years are getting wasted? What compromises are you making to indulge your flesh so that these very powerful and formative years are getting taken by taken from you by demons? That's a real question. So young men in the room, link up with some other young men who don't suck. Okay? I actually wrote something else in there but I'm not saying it because I'm on camera, okay? (laughs) Link up with some young men who don't suck and get to work on whatever God's called you to do. Some of y'all hang out with some people, they just suck, man. And you aren't strong enough in the Lord to transform their life yet. And maybe you will be if you get to work and stop hanging out with people who suck.
And do not connect yourself with a woman unless you are willing to sacrifice the personal calling on your life and pursue God's calling for your family unit. Do not connect yourself with a woman unless you're willing to sacrifice the personal calling, the personal desires. Do not link up with a woman and connect yourself with a woman unless you are very, very much ready to sacrifice every single one of your desires. Do you know what the first time that the word love is used in the Bible, the very first time the word love is used in the Bible, God goes to a man named Abraham who couldn't have children for 90 years. He gives that man a child. And then he goes to that man and he says, I want you to take that son whom you love and sacrifice him to me. If you're going to connect yourself to a woman and not love her enough to sacrifice the things that you love, do not connect yourself with a woman. Dear God, please don't. So there's like, a, there's like an invitation, right? It, it doesn't matter the programs that we do as a church. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. The sermons or whatever, it doesn't matter. Unless there are men who are really, really willing and ready to be men in their homes and, there's, and, and young men who are ready to be young men in their schools and with their friends. Period. Because the other alternative is women who bring their kids who long who long to see the presence of God in their home, but don't. Women who bring their kids because they're finding more of a family at church than they do inside the walls of their house. That cannot be the way that it is. The church cannot be the replacement for the family. It cannot be the replacement for the family. The church is not the fundamental building block. The family is the fundamental building block. And so if I try to build a church that replaces a family, the, 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 the favor of God is not on it. If we try to build a church that replaces a family, the favor of God is not on it. But the favor of God is on men who want to walk in their role, women who want to walk in their role, and then, and then children who grow up inside of that, who have every understanding of who they are and what they were made for as opposed to leaving college confused and done with this place called church. So, right, so that's that's the invitation, right? And so if you'll you'll do this for me, guys. Um, First, if you are a man in the room and it's like, man, I want to go, I want to go on that journey. I legit don't want to leave you. I don't want to leave you without an option. We don't have systematic processes set up to say, hey, yeah, do this, 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 don't. But we do have strong men in this room and strong families in this room that would love to coach you and love to walk with you as we grow into what it looks like to be a strong man and a strong woman. So if you would, if you take that connect card and all you need to do on the back is say, I need some coaching or I need some help, or I need some guidance, or I need to just put something on the back and put your name and your email or your name and your phone number on the front and put that in the black box on the way out and we will reach out to you and we'll guide you. And so uh, that's a step that we can take. Um, I want to pray for us before we get out of here. Uh, we're not going to have time to worship today, but I do want to pray for us. So if you were a, if you were a dad, uh, would you stand up real quick? Would y'all give them a round of applause real quick? And so we honor you guys. We honor you guys 
as fathers. We honor the way that you have been given a special gift to reflect who God is, who God the Father is. We honor you right now. We honor you right now. We bless you. Bless the work of your hands. We bless the meditations of your heart. We bless the desires that you have. And we bless those moments where you've got to sacrifice the desires that you have. We bless your future. We bless your family. We bless your home. If you're a son in the room, would you stand up? Would you stand up? There we go. There we go. There we go. And so sons in the room, I bless you guys. We bless you as a church. We bless you in the name of Jesus with a full heart, with a full heart and a full confidence that you've been made for something really important. And that really important thing might be marrying a woman. That really important thing might be raising a child. That really important thing might not be getting married at all, but following the calling of God with a group of people around you that can fulfill something powerful. But I bless you right now in the name of Jesus with a powerful life and a powerful future and something of meaning and something of value that's not just fulfilling pleasures, but it's doing something real and something lively and something, something, something good, right? Something meaningful. And so if you're a mom in the room, would you stand up? No, the rest of y'all stay standing. No, I didn't say sit down. Y'all better stay standing. Every, yeah. And so moms, I bless you in the name of Jesus and we bless you. You carry a load that we don't see. You wake up in the middle of the night. You feed babies. You make phone calls. You glue the family together. You're concerned about the relational impact of one child on another child. You prepare dinner. You prepare breakfast. You think about the groceries. You actually make clean socks appear in drawers. Daggum. I know some of you men do your own logic. We're talking about generalities. Okay, let's not get weird. You're a backbone. You're beautiful. You're meaningful. We bless you with that sort of labor. And so if you're a daughter in this room, would you stand up? And so I bless you, daughters. I bless you, daughters, with courage, with boldness, and with glory that your life would be like a crown of glory. That your life would be a glorious one that is free from unclean things, that is free from insecurity, that is free from meaninglessness, that is free from insecurity, that is free from darkness latching onto it. And so I bless you daughters in the name of Jesus. I bless you daughters in the name of Jesus that you would lead a glorious life. That, that God the Father shares His glory with His daughters. And so I bless your voices and your words with graciousness and kindness. I bless the words that come out of your mouth. They would not be words that pull down. They would not be words that strike down, but they would be words that build up the daughters around you, the sisters around you. I bless you in the name of Jesus with words that give life and a sensitivity to the Spirit of God and a sensitivity to other spirits that want to turn you into something that you are not. You are a glorious creature, a beautiful creature. You are an incredible being. And there are good things in store for you. And so we bless you as a church with all of those good things. And for endurance in your development. And for endurance to become the glorious thing that God has created you to be. And so man, Mosaic Church, I just bless you guys. For real, for real. I love you guys. And so, Father, we say thank you so much right now. We say thank you for the freedom to go to 1220 in a church service. Praise God. <laughs> and so, Father, we do. We say thank you for being with us. Holy Spirit, we say thank you for what you're making us into. Jesus, we say thank you for walking among us. 
Thank you for the visions and the things that you are realizing in the Weigels. Thank you so much for the impact that that's going to make. Thank you for these families that have dedicated themselves to you today, God. Thank you so much that they are putting their hands on the really important thing in life of building and filling out a family. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We bless that.